name is Vanessa, and I don't really have that much of a background in gaming. Um, when I was growing up, I mostly played uh, The Sims, Caesar 3, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch Brat Attack because I wasn't allowed to play American McGee's Alice. I have now since played Alice, and I love it. I recommend it. So, um, for me, I have much more of a background in literature, so this is going to be quite an academic talk in contrast to uh, all the other funny people. Uh, <laughs> I have footnotes. So, I have an English literature degree, and for my dissertation, I wrote about the unreliable narrator in Nabokov. Uh, has anyone read any Nabokov? Yay! Few people. Woohoo! Butterflies and weird sex. So, the... <laughs> So the trope of the unreliable narrator is a major one in literature, uh, going back as far as Chaucer and even beyond that. Uh, we have narrators such as Nellie Dean in Wuthering Heights. Uh, we have Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby, as well as Martha Namus's entire back catalogue. Um, that's a literature joke right there. Uh, <laughs> there were jokes, I just... Didn't... Okay, so... <laughs> gaming. So the unreliable narrator in literature is defined as not merely deceptive, but also, yeah, it worked, mistaken or believing himself to have qualities which the author denies him. So the games that I'm going to be talking about this evening, um, the Bioshock and Portal series, transform the idea of the unreliable narrator in literature into unreliable guides and narrators of past events within the games. So these games aren't the only games to do so. Indeed, there has been some criticism of video games for constantly using twist endings, and it's starting to be seen as quite an aging trope. However, my argument is that even though we're so used to the unreliable narrator as a or video game guide, uh, it doesn't make it any less enjoyable to play when well executed and still enhances the gaming experiences. And I think you'll all agree that these particular games are pretty fucking good. So... To state the obvious, video games are very, very different to books and indeed films. Books and films can be glanced back at or rewound. You can read the same chapter over again. Video game cutscenes, for example, are more difficult to look back at unless you save just before the cutscene to watch it again or find it on a yeah, let's play on YouTube and maybe you have to deal with PewDiePie's narration and yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, the reveal of the unreliable narrator in video games is different to that in other media. It's quicker, and depending on how it's presented, it can surprise the player so much that they might miss some information. It's then up to the game's creators to ensure that the shock of the revealed deception continues and settles in for the player as they continue playing. So, I'd like to consid consider this continued shock by looking first at Bioshock. Bit of rhyming there, I also write poetry. Uh, <laughs> We begin with a cutscene where our protagonist, Jack, is on an airplane thinking about his family, looking at a nice little present that they've given him. And we're also told that Jack is special by his own narration. But before this can be continued, Jack's field of vision seems to wobble, we cut to black with all the sounds of an airplane crash landing. Jack is then plunged into the Atlantic Ocean. The player guides him to a tower and eventually we're transported to Rapture, the underwater city created by Andrew Ryan. The journey is not smooth. We're constantly plunged into darkness. There's flickering electronic stuff all over the place. We have Ryan's tinny megalomaniac speech about rapture, and we witness one monstrous splicer murder another while we're trapped in a tiny bathysphere. So when we hear a polite, comforting, and human voice asking us to kindly pick up the shortwave radio, it's something of a relief. So this is the voice of Atlas, the Irish proletariat, every man figure of Bioshock who guides us through Rapture, giving us its history, helping us survive splicer attacks, and providing a stark contrast of health, warmth, and arguable norm normality against the horrors of Rapture. Up against characters like the deranged Sander Cohen and the elitist cold-hearted Andrew Ryan, it's understandable that R Atlas presents a figure with whom the player will easily align themselves. After all, even his desires are understandable. He just wants to get his wife and child to safety, doesn't he? So there are two ma major twists in Bioshock. One is that Atlas is re revealed to be a character created by Fon Frank Fontaine, a gangster who led a failed coup against Ryan. Fontaine intends to take over Rapture and has used Jack to do it, not just during the game, but also before the game even starts. 
This is a massive betrayal of the player, both in-game and re retroactively. And there's a great payoff in being, to being able to fight and defeat Fontaine, who by this time has transformed himself into a monstrous creature, which highlights just how far from Atlas he's traveled as a character. The narrator of our journey through Rapture, the, guide of vo guide, the voice of guidance and sanity, has turned out to warp the story to fit into his required narrative to make Jack get what he, Atlas or Fontaine, needs. There's, I don't know about you, but there's a definite satisfaction in watching him being stabbed to death by loads of little sisters. Hey, get him, Mr. Bowles. So, <laughs> that was my little sister voice. Uh, I won't do it again, I promise. So, <laughs> the other major twist of Bioshock, which is tied in with Fontaine's reveal, is that Jack himself is an unreliable narrator. The gameplay always shows Jack's point of view as if we're looking out of his eyes so that the player discovers that Jack is even responsible for the airplane crash at the beginning of the game. And this can arguably cause confusion and shock on a far greater scale than Fontaine's reveal. This isn't just a voice on a radio. This is who we are spending disbelief to become in the game. The lack of autonomy on Jack's part due to the conditioned phrase, would you kindly, is, I think, most brutally illustrated when the player finds a tape recording of a young Jack being forced to kill a puppy. Have you all heard that one? It's horrible, isn't it? So, this moment of absolute and brutal horror made more so by the contrasting adverb of kindly, I told you it was going to get academic, uh, <laughs> drives home to the player that the fact that even though we know that characters in video games have no autonomy, it's highlighted and it's given a plausible, terrible explanation. This tape and the room it's discovered in also offer the player a chance to connect all the information provided and deal with the shock of the would you kindly reveal, as well as the fact that Jack is the illegitimate child of Andrew Ryan and has in fact returned to Rapture, manipulated and moulded by Fontaine and other prominent <laughs> citizens. Bioshock challenges our willingness to believe in the character we're guiding and forces us to consider our own perceived reality within the game. Portal is also played from the POV of the protagonist, but Chell's character is largely left to the interpretation of the player. There are some hints in Portal 2 and some various threads on Reddit about how her father is probably Cave Johnson, the founder of Apogee Science, which allows for a comparison between her and Bioshock's Jack. But these and other fandom theories, I believe personally, aren't necessary uh, to the game's core enjoyment. So the first Portal game's reveal of GLaDOS, the supercomputer in charge of Aperture Science, as the villain is well executed. But I don't think that anyone playing was really surprised when Chell reached the final boss level to find GLaDOS and she was going to be sort of thrown into the Asyrenote. Oh. So there's a slow increasing drip feed of menace in the game, from occasional voice glitches and wall-mounted cam cameras that track your every movement, to the killer robot turrets in Chamber 16, to the moment when you are being carried towards an incinerator. With this ultimate proof that GLaDOS is not and never has been on your side, the test situation of Portal is discarded, and the freshly betrayed player finds himself working through the backstage areas of Aperture's testing facility. This contrast of grungy, rusting platforms and staircases against the bright and shiny test chambers further enforces the player's willingness to go up against GLaDOS and gain revenge for her betrayal. With a bit of Darren Do in there as well. <laughs> So Portal is a much-loved and critically acclaimed game, and of course there was a sequel. Um, so thinking about the unreliable narrator, Portal 2 offers far greater scope for this idea. Having been dragged back into the facility at the end of the first Portal game, Chell is once again in the Aperture Science facility. The player is instructed to move around, look at a picture on the wall, and eventually sleep for an undetermined but short period of time. However, a malfunction takes place, and Chell is woken far into the future. Uh, the room dirty from lack of care, it's dark, the painting on the wall is showing a much darker, darker and threatening scene. As in Bioshock, the player is relieved from this threatening, unpleasant situation by an apparently friendly character, Wheatley. Wheatley is a small, spherical robot voiced by the wonderful Stephen Merchant, whose Bristolian accent gives Wheatley a similar everyman feel to that of the Irish-accented Atlas. He also notes his various jobs in the facility, thus assuring us that Wheatley is representative of the common working character. This, and Wheatley's additional comedy, makes us trust him pretty much immediately. Wheatley is the one to get the player out of the bedroom into the facility, albeit somewhat haphazardly, and he is the one who guides us around the first few levels of the game. 
There are some clues to Wheatley's actual feelings and characteristics. He assumes that the person who defeated GLaDOS is male, uh, quickly corrects himself when referring to smelly humans, and is shown to be capable of concealing himself from the player after the initial reunion with GLaDOS. However, Wheatley does also seem to believe himself to be in the right and can be perceived as believing so. His enthusiasm at being reunited with the player is undeniable, and he initially wants to help Chell take down GLaDOS. It's not until he experiences the full power that GLaDOS wields that he is corrupted by it and betrays the player, sending both Chell and a potato-encased GLaDOS into the depths of its facility. This journey allows the player to receive and understand information, nearly dropping my notes, about Wheatley, given by GLaDOS, their former enemy, thus already setting up Wheatley's defeat with GLaDOS's help while still acclimatizing the player to their betrayal. This betrayal is far greater than that in the first Portal game. Although there are, as mentioned, hints at Wheatley's eventual corruption, he is presented as the player's friend, at times even able to be picked up by the player, rather than just being a semi-robotic voice carried throughout the facility. Wheatley's belief that he can control the facility is slowly eroded as the game progresses, and he is eventually mad with power even as the facility begins to fall apart around him. His own personal narrative of the game's plot, according to him, is evidently different from what is happening but his refusal to give up is both satisfying and annoying. On a final note, the, the player has to trust GLaDOS and even partially repeat the journey they went through with Wheatley to replace GLaDOS as the core needed to restore order to Aperture. Now, of course, this is a video game and it only has one narrative path, but I feel it's still worth noting how, despite GLaDOS's previous betrayal of the player, we have to trust her in order to save both Chell and the facility. So... The unreliable narrator is one whose statements are untrue by the standards of his own narrative audience. Wheatley believes that he can conceal information from Chell, and Atlas, although a cre cre character created by Fontaine, knows that he must convince Jack that he's real in order to achieve his goals. In conclusion, it's important to remember that we are required to trust in and allow ourselves to be swept up by the narrative presence in video games, as in films and books, in order to enjoy them. While video games naturally propel us towards the actions we need to take in order to complete them, if we keep thinking about what's around the corner in terms of the plot, we won't stop to smell the roses, metaphorically. While betraying the player has been repeated, turn page, to the point of satura saturation, Portal and Bioshock, I would argue, deploy that betrayal in such a way that even on repeat, repeat plays, the player is still shocked, still entertained, and still thirsty for revenge. Thank you.